welcome to um, the 33rd episode of the RSM's COVID-19 series, which is for health professionals, by health professionals, and designed to give healthcare workers on the front lines regular and easy access to updates from healthcare leaders on COVID-19. Today there is a great panel of educationists, and we are going to explore COVID and its impact on educational progress, the Dean's response, lessons learned, and our future directions. There is also a Q&A function at the top of the screen for us to use uh, for questions I can put to the panelists. I'd like to introduce our panelists to uh, there, so Andrew Goddard, who is our college president at the Royal College of Physicians. Afternoon. Mike Jones, our medical director at the JRCPTB. Good afternoon. Andrew Dina, head of school for London. Hello. And Nancy Riley, our, our IMT trainee from London. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. And I'd, I'd really like to start the webinar by thanking our trainees generally for their commitment, selflessness, and for their sheer hard work during these difficult times. So on that note, I might start off with you, Nancy, to say, well, how did COVID affect your sort of day-to-day -day working? Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's difficult to say. Um, the experience amongst trainees, and I certainly don't want to attempt to speak for all trainees, but it provided a lot of challenges and put us in kind of a new um, working environment or something that none of us had ever experienced before. Um, it was certainly challenging on both a professional and personal level, um, as it was for everyone. So not only were we dealing with new disease, new management, new protocols, but we were also separate from our friends and family for periods than probably any of us had been before. Um, the experience, I think, as well, was you know every challenge was first presented to trainees and junior doctors and then would be filtered up to those in more senior positions. So something that we encountered we would then pass on to our seniors and then maybe the problem would be addressed. Uh, so we came, we came, I suppose, head on with these problems early March. And um, I would say that um, it, COVID has greatly impacted trainees, but I think it will continue to impact trainees for the future of medical training. Um, I don't think that just what we've experienced now will be a catch up. I think that it will continue to affect how we go about all of our training programs from now on. Um, and I think we need to, as you all know, prepare for that and certainly something that all trainees would like to be involved in. Um, I suppose our experience, you know, a new presentation, new management, we had no idea what the impact control policy would be. We had no idea what PPE we should be using. And if we had adequate PPE, um, we were thrown into discussions about resuscitation and escalation of care where many junior doctors would never have had these discussions before where it would have always been a more senior clinician taking on this discussion um, but it also provided new opportunities in terms of leadership and management um, which I think a lot of people and I, I think as trainees and junior doctors always do they take on these challenges and they take up roles um, you know at a, at a junior level and then can expand their skills in this way and certainly that was my experience and that was something I heavily got involved in which was something that certainly benefited my training during the time and um, that we were in the centre of the pandemic I suppose um, but it's a huge question so it's very difficult to know exactly what to uh, focus on. Well, you've covered a, a vast array of topics that, uh, and experiences that other trainees have had and, and sounds like a, a very interesting time. I'm going to move on to Andrew, if that's okay, because Andrew, I mean, you, you've been on the front line as well as your educational hat. But what challenges did you face uh, in the initial stages? So I'm, a, as well as head of school of medicine, um, I'm an interventional cardiologist, but I have a split role um, between a DGH in North East London and Bart's. Um, and I happened that the first week when lockdown was about to happen, I was, it was my week on the wards at Bart's, but it soon became obvious that work was disappearing at Bart's and my time would be best spent at King George. So I went back to King George within about 10 minutes of arriving and saying, I'm back to help. The, I was told that the hospital uh, medical director was self-isolating and would I take up the role? So <laughs> as soon as I walked through the door, I was trying to reorganize things. And that in itself was a challenge. But uh, I think as lots of people have already pointed out um, in writing and when speaking at these sorts of meetings, people pull together and 
within a few days, having had meetings of all the staff together, both the trainees, the non-training juniors, and the consultants, um, we engendered a, a really good sort of blitz spirit, and uh, we worked together. We all had to learn about COVID. The respiratory physicians were fantastic. They quickly set up a series of uh, things like this, on online webinar type lecturing to get us up to speed. Um, and uh, we all worked together. One of the biggest challenges was that one by one, we all caught COVID. So the, the organization of how we were gonna protect each other, both medical, nursing and others was really poor. We just weren't ready for it. And I think about half of the staff uh, ended up with, with COVID. So within a week of going back, I was off work um, reasonably unwell, but fortunately not as unwell as many others, and then was off for about a week, came back. Um, but even when I was off, we were doing online meetings to try and get people together. We spent a lot of time trying to sort out rotors. Rotor management was incredibly difficult. And as a result of that, training went by the by, but I think that the trainees gained a huge amount from the experience of dealing with this. Um, their general medical training was enhanced as a result. They're dealing with difficult situations, families, end of life care was enhanced hugely. Um, it's a very sad uh, way to have enhanced your training, but uh, that they would have gained from that. But those who were expecting to be doing procedures, specialist clinics missed out as a result because they had to concentrate on dealing with the, the front door. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss that in more detail as we go along in the next 45 minutes. I might take that point and, and take it to Mike, actually. I think um, the number of trainees who are due to have rotations and rotate on that have sort of stayed in a single specialty for eight months uh, and, uh, as they put it, deny the opportunity to move on. Uh, I guess, uh, why was that sort of decision made? And secondly, what impact do you think they'll have in the future training? These are very good points. Um, the decision obviously was taken because people were planning for the worst and hoping for the best. And depending on where you were in the country, I think it's fair to say that the experience was very different. Um, in some areas, the impact was much less than in some of the most severely um, affected. So making sure people were available to provide care at the front door for the anticipated weight of patients that were coming in with uh, COVID was entirely appropriate. And uh, at JRC PTB, we agreed entirely with the need to suspend rotations so that the teams that had been established could continue functioning and providing optimal care to the patients that were coming in. Having said that, of course, there are certain experiences that have to be acquired and they are defined in the separate curricula and where those experiences have not been achieved and therefore the learning outcomes not achieved, there is a, an absolute requirement uh, for those experiences to be achieved later in training, um, especially in internal medicine training where the uh, capabilities are well described and the learning outcomes are well described. It's been made very clear to the heads of school and the TPDs in internal medicine that those that did not rotate into um, care of the elderly medicine or to critical care medicine will have to have that experience later in their training period. There are of course two years of internal medicine training still to go and hopefully therefore uh, everybody will be able to get those uh, experiences. Thank you. Well, that's a challenge, but I think we're negotiating at the moment. I mean, another challenge, Andrew, was, was around recruitment. Um, and how, how, do you, how do you hold recruitment when uh, no one's allowed to go to interviews? What was that process like? Were you involved in any of those issues? I think most of us in the School of Medicine, so there's myself and two uh, deputies, we were so... Uh, involved with the front line. I mean, we, we are three of us all work in London, of course, as London heads of school, and London was really hard hit. I mean, we were doing long hours, we were doing on calls. I was sleeping in at King George, my on calls for the first time ever. Um, and I just let the college, I just let um, HET, uh, the health education team, get, get on with things. And there, there were a group of 
uh, colleagues within HEE who put a huge amount of effort in, in sorting out recruitment, um, which was basically done in absentia. So people had put in their, their applications and they had to find a way of recruiting without seeing anyone face to face because it would have been incredibly difficult to organize face to face interviews, even if it were online. People were just so busy. Many people were unwell. Um, so they, they went through a, a process of trying to make it as fair as possible. I'm not sure it was perfect. But I'm sure there are many uh, trainees who had applied for posts who feel unhappy the the system worked in the way that it did. But I think they did an incredible job. People like Joe Schramm, really, we, we should uh, thank them hugely for the amount of time they put in to do a, a very complicated uh, process. And they've learned a lot from it. And uh, if we're in a similar position for the second round or even for next year's recruitment, I think they would, uh, they'd have learned enough to improve it uh, and have uh, a fairer outcome. Uh, but what they did do, I think, was as fair as possible. I may put that question to Bod, actually, because you must have heard a lot of noise and a lot of feedback around the process. Some unhappy people didn't get posts. What, what's your view on this? My reflection is that everything, the decisions that were made in the early days, uh, you know, all happened very, very quickly. And I can remember us sort of really angsting about, well, do we, do we try and do sort of the exam, sort of the written parts of the exam, do we try and sort of make a socially distanced way, or because there's somehow we can continue with the paces. Now, in retrospect, we shouldn't, you know, th those were silly thoughts that we could have ever done that, and we should have just sort of made those decisions and then moved on. Now, with recruitment, it's a bit like the Nightingale Hospitals, you know, I think we were expecting things to be absolutely awful and we had to plan as though they were uh, and the biggest challenge was going to be having people available to interview and as Andrew said you know he was so busy clinically that actually the thought of him being able to free up a couple of days or more to to interview people uh, just wasn't going to be possible but there are other parts in the southwest where they that you know they were hardly impacting there were people twiddling their thumbs who could have quite easily done uh, video interviews so the retrospectoscopes are a wonderful thing and you say well if, if you know if we'd have known that we would have had capacity to do that then clearly video interviews would have been the way forward but we didn't and we were expecting uh, a tsunami and in some places it was a tsunami and it was awful for everybody involved so I, th I think, yeah, it was some of the decisions you could criticise, but it was what we had to do at the time. Uh, and we need to try and make sure that those people who have been adversely affected by it, because undoubtedly some people have, you know, people are not able to uh, take parts of the exam, that they are not penalised either now or within the next year or so of training so they can continue to move forward. And, you know, so, and, and, and things have been put in place to allow that. At the end of the day, the, the process has gone forward and we've got doctors coming in August and uh, October, which is which is fantastic. Uh, I guess we, I'll, I'll go to Mike next with you around the, um, the requirements and the and the, and the workload. The, the curriculum is one area that might was struggled. And how, how did you come around the process of trying to assess our trainees, given that their curriculum requirements weren't entirely fulfilled? As uh, Bod is saying, we've made significant modifications to allow people to progress the ARCP process was made very much like touch to enable pretty much everybody to progress to the next year of training recognizing that within the rcp process there would be have to be an identification of the learning experiences that have been missed that uh, where the people have not managed to get the competencies under their belt and the only people that we felt could not progress um to uh any uh, particular point were those that had not yet got the specialty certificate exam that they required to get to CCT. Right throughout medical training in all the specialties, we were trying to promote people moving to the next year, recognizing what they were missing from the curriculum and getting support from uh, their educational supervisors and indeed their clinical supervisors on the job. So. Basically, we do believe that as things are standing now, it should be possible for everybody to start getting their competencies under their belt. 
the difficulties will occur in the areas of training and indeed service that are a bit slower getting off the ground again for very obvious reasons and those relate mainly to the craft specialties um, such as endoscopy, uh, GI endoscopy, bronchoscopy etc and those we're still having negotiation and discussion to see how we can get everybody with an appropriate learning experience to try and move forward um, to get everybody trained the way we uh, believe they can and should be. It certainly had, had a positive effect and a supportive effect, I, I hope. So, I mean, Nancy, did you, uh, did you feel worried that you weren't going to meet your critical requirements this year, facing Andrew with a, a challenging ARCP? I suppose um, initially, as it you know, was first unfolding, I think you know, our curriculum requirements were at you know, the last thing on everyone's mind. Um, but quickly as the year progressed, we realized that, you know, July and October for various levels of training was coming quite quickly. Um, I think most of my colleagues felt like um, the guidance that was issued um, was enough that, that we felt that we had, you know, an, enough information for what we required. But I think what most people worried about was exam progression. Um, so whether, you know, they might make the, the um, altered curriculum requirements for the year or whether they would overall manage to get them by the end of the training program or get their exams by the end of the training program, I think is what still concerns a lot of trainees. And there's a lot of, lot of uh, talk around well-being and support. Were there, were there interventions put in there or were there uh, areas made available to you to support you during this process? So I would say that it probably varied from trust to trust and um, certainly in the trust that I was in we had a lot of support both from um, our senior colleagues and consultants I think supported juniors quite well and also the there were health and well-being services set up and there was counselling available and so actually services that would be useful to have all the time not just in a pandemic suddenly became available and I hope that's something that doesn't go away because it's certainly something that that juniors and trainees need um, all the time in every every stage of their training. That's a very, very important point. Um, you know, the, the, the reflections that I've heard from trainees all over the country were very much that, yeah, there, there seems to be a difference between trust, but those trusts that invested in supporting the well-being of all of their staff, especially trainees, really reap the benefits of that. Uh, and the people plan, the, the great va vaunted NHS people plan, uh, is due out hopefully within the next week or so. And I'm led to understand that they have uh, within that talked about the, the wellbeing services that were put in during COVID and ensuring that they remain in place. Because I think it, it, you know, it has shown to be a great benefit. Uh, and what we've all been saying and what, what the Michael West report said, you know, ha has all come home to roost. So hopefully uh, those advances we've made during COVID about supporting the wellbeing of trainees and other medical staff uh, are with us to stay. But I think some trusts will, will be tempted to try and pull back and save some money, but we're really going to have to push hard to make sure they stay. I think it's absolutely essential. And I think we'll come back to the future, Doctor, because I think it's a really interesting important. Can I add something there, Nick? So yeah, please. One, one of the things that became obvious was that the disparity of distribution uh, of doctors and maybe other staff as well, but I don't know as much about that, um, became really clear. So at somewhere like King George, where we have far fewer trainees than say at, at one of the big teaching hospitals up in town, we were really scrambling, scrambling around to, to fill our rotors. So it became very obvious. You couldn't run a night on take with one registrar, two SHOs, you needed two SHO grades. You needed far more trainees. Fortunately, people stopped being trained in other areas and we were able to get people back from the community, but it took a huge amount of effort to find people. And I think part of what we need to do in the future is look at how we distribute doctors because when crisis occur, crises occur, uh, we need the staff on the front line. Um, and we can't just accept that some area, some unit, some uh, education providers have far larger numbers of staff to call upon than others. And, and there needs to be some fairness about it. And I'm sure there are many trusts outside London who suffer it just as badly as us, even not, if not worse. I might let take that point up now and ask Bod actually. I mean, when the second wave comes, what are we going to do differently? I mean, because I think Andrew's touched on some points, it's when planning's needed. Yeah, so I, I think one of the positive things about the, the first wave was the FIY ones, uh, and that many places that had those uh, doctors 
effectively uh, in the workforce really benefited from it and it'd be interesting to hear from, from Nancy whether she's heard reflections but but what I've heard and what we what I've seen is that because there were more hands and feet on the shop floor so to speak that everybody felt the pressure was just a little bit lower uh, and the FIY ones loved it um, and whilst it was a bit scary they actually felt they could step up to it so I, I think that we've learned a lot the trouble with the second wave is we won't have that group because that won't be available. So that was whatever, three, three and a half thousand or 3,300 uh, doctors for the NHS that we won't have. But on the positive side, I do think that we have learned a lot about what are the services that we can keep going uh, and also where we need to focus uh, the workforce on. Because um, there were some parts of the hospital which their activity just really, really sunk. Um, and I think we can be a lot more intelligent about not stopping everything and having loads of people twiddling their thumbs, stopping bits, but also then moving other people to, uh, to support the bits that would be at the respiratory wards or the acute medicine wards uh, and or ITU in a more effective way. You know, I've, everybody dreads a second wave. The feeling is there will be a second wave. The only issue is how much of winter uh, that we would expect are we going to see? If we have a big flu hit, who knows what's going to happen? But then again, some of the social distancing and wearing of masks in public and things might actually stop the spread of normal respiratory pathogens. Uh, and we may see less of that and people's behaviour may change. We might get less norovirus, which would be fantastic. Um, so I, I think everybody's sort of waiting on sort of tender hooks to see what happens. It's amazing what washing your hands can do. Just wanted to take up that point as well on the basis that it reinforces um, the generalist skills that uh, we've been trying to um, pursue to, to really get everybody up to speed to be able to manage um, the sick patient. Um, I think nothing has portrayed that quite as well as the pandemic where we had people from all areas of the hospital coming in and if they didn't automatically have the skills to manage the acutely ill, then they learned them very quickly. And we could show that people who had been through physician training were very quickly uh, learning skills that perhaps might have been a, become a little bit rusty, but were there in them and therefore were very, very helpful. And I think it's been shown with physicians going into intensive care where it isn't necessarily an immediate part of their remit. And indeed, others from the profession have been incorporated into many different areas of the hospital, everybody working together to really try and produce a, a proper response to the benefit of patients. I think so. Uh, certainly the uh, redeployed doctors and the interim F1s were essential parts of our work. In, and so locally, they easily assimilated and being part of the team and provided continuity, which was a real key when the surgery was going forward. So I think we should thank that group in particular. I'm, I'm going to ask you, Andrew, I mean, one of the questions that's just come up is around clinical skills and procedure days and simulation. How are we going to do these things in, in the current area? Have you got any plans for simulation or procedure days? We're working on it. It's, there's a lot that needs, needs to be done. Um, there's some work by one of the uh, postgraduate deans in London, Gita Men, on looking at uh, ways of providing um, top-up training for endoscopy, for instance, with uh, some intensive uh, periods of training, especially for those coming towards the end of their training who need to get their endoscopy skills up to, up to scratch, having not been able to do them for going on towards four to six months now. Um, Simulation training is a tough one, but there, there's talking, we've been talking about how this can be done uh, in an appropriate way. Um, and it will depend to some extent on social distancing and, and so forth, but th there should be a way, way around it. The question that's come up, and uh, possibly for Bod, I mean, paces in the future, how is paces going to be run in the future? So there's been a huge amount of debate about that. Um, so most people will be aware that other specialties, other colleges, have gone sort of away from a patient facing model. Um, and we debated hard about that, but we did survey all the trainees and the feeling was that they felt that, you know, a patient facing exam was important. Um, you know, this, the skill of a physician uh, is being able to detect clinical signs uh, together with a history and synthesize that into a diagnosis and a management plan. Uh, and we have to test that and those communication skills. Now, 
Uh, clearly, medicine has changed a lot in the past five months. Uh, and so some of that will have to be done through PPE. So no great harm in sort of getting people to do clinical cases with PPE on. Um, I think we need to make, we need to mitigate any risks to do with a patient facing exam as much as possible. So that in, you know, trying to ensure that we use low risk patients, that uh, we minimize the number of examiners in the room, that we minimize the number of people on a cycle. We will reduce the number of patients that people have to do, but essentially the plan is to try and produce paces in a similar model um, to what is done currently. So people don't feel there's a sudden, all, all the rules are suddenly changed and they're having to do a different exam than they've been preparing for. Um, now, the, as people will know, the sort of applications opened on Monday, so we're, we're still planning to go ahead with that. Um, we're quite keen to try and do as many as possible as we can in the autumn. Uh, we have some backup plans just in case there's another massive hit of COVID um, and we can't do that. But I'm hoping that we will be able to do a modified patient basis, patient facing paces this autumn so people can continue um, to progress. We will clearly prioritise uh, the small number of people who were not able to sit paces prior to uh, sort of the August break. Uh, and the ST3 progression uh, first, uh, and we are only going to examine clinically in autumn the uh, people who are working in the UK at the moment. That's really helpful. Uh, Nancy, I'm going to ask you a question because it's come through around risk. Did, 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 you, do you, did you feel or do you, other trainees feel they were put at risk during this period of time? It's quite a controversial question. Or did you feel protected? I suppose, I mean, none of us knew what the risk was going to be. Um, we certainly had, you know, seen on, you know, on the news and on social media that there were doctors and there were junior doctors who were becoming unwell around the world. Um, I think most of us felt that, uh, you know, those, those of us who have no major, you know, illnesses in the background and also don't live with family members or aren't living with anyone vulnerable, that, you know, we were relatively... Um, you know, that our risk was relatively low. And I think what a lot of, you know, the burden that a lot of trainees carried was the risk that it posed to people around them. And I think there was a lot of concern at the start because the guidance around PPE and also the provision of PPE was, was unknown. Uh, there was a feeling that we wouldn't have enough and there was almost kind of a panic at the start that people were using it inappropriately and that we would run out. Um, and I guess just as the pandemic went on, people people's opinion of that risk changed and, you know, probably some people then became a little bit complacent while others still maintained uh, kind of a, a high element of risk averse behavior and, and looking after themselves. So I think everyone had um, had a very different experience and a very different assessment of their own risk. Many of my colleagues have had to shield and um, many became, you know, many at my level became quite unwell. Um, and, you know, uh, also, obviously, you know, nursing colleagues who have probably even more exposure and they became unwell too. And so the junior, junior doctors were all seeing that and, and considering that during the time. Um, but thankfully, you know, no close colleagues of mine were ever seriously unwell. But I'm only speaking for myself in that regard. I might ask, ask Mike, because um, Nancy talked about trainees that are shielded and had missed how, how will they catch up in terms of the curriculum of their career progression? Yeah, and, and that very much depends on why people were shielding. Um, obviously, there's multiple causes for that. And this is going to be something that will be delivered in the locality. Um, the recommendation, of course, is that people discuss with their educational supervisor or their training program director about what uh, their future uh, career can be. If it's a permanent um, reason for shielding, then there will be a concern that needs to be explored to ensure that the, the individual remains safe as much as they can be. Um, if it's other reasons for shielding, then of course there will have to be what's called a gap analysis of the areas that they've missed in training. And again, going back to ensure that the training program will provide the experiences that are necessary for them to gain the competences that are defined within the curriculum. Um, this has been discussed with heads of school and indeed there is an acceptance that this will need to occur uh, right across the country to ensure that no uh, trainee is more disadvantaged than the pandemic is causing already to some individuals. That was really helpful, that's all. And I was just going to ask Andrew, in, ter in terms of how we've changed our clinical practice, what's your experience of the outpatient setting or 
your college experience of, of the virtual type of clinic uh, and is that good enough for training our trainees of the future? I've been involved with uh, clinics that have basically become telephone clinics um, in one area. I've also done some online clinics with uh, something similar to Zoom. Um, both work, but are much more better suited for follow-ups and going through results. They're not ideal for new patients, but they're a good way to triage, I suppose. Um, I suppose one thing that I worry about most is that coincidental pickup of unexpected pathology that you sometimes get uh, if you do a proper as you, when you do a proper and thorough examination one of the things as a cardiologist I tend to do in middle-aged patients is always examine their abdomen for a, an aneurysm and every so often I'll pick up an unexpected aneurysm that's not going to happen if I'm triaging uh, online virtually um, gastroenterologists have talked about how they pick up a few cancers every year that they weren't expecting uh, by feeding large livers or whatever. So those sorts of things are going to get missed. Um, I think probably the best way we the best we can do is to have a triage system and then make sure that we have a system for being able to see patients face to face as uh, the situation allows. Now in terms of training, um, training our juniors to do virtual consultations is very difficult particularly as we're only teaching ourselves how to do it and none of us have probably perfected it as, as yet but we're going to have to start teaching them very soon I know that some are starting to do it and um, there are systems available where you can do an online consultation where two of you are, are involved in the consultation you can work together and um, obviously it's somewhat time consuming to do that um, but on the whole, I, I find the virtual consultations are, are rather quicker than they are when you're doing a face-to-face -face consultation. This is a, this was a big area, and we recognised it really quite quickly. Where, uh, and as Andrew's saying, um, normally when we're asking people to be assessed, we expect the assessor to have the uh, capabilities, competencies in that particular area. But I think everybody has been learning about uh, virtual consultation, and so what we have tried to do is provide some guidance on the JRCPTB website about how um, trainees can get experience in virtual clinics and how they can be assessed because obviously within internal medicine training for instance there is a requirement for outpatient experience we did not ex expect to be defining virtual clinics um, at this particular time when the uh, curriculum is fairly new we had defined what was necessary from outpatient experience but now we're altering the number of clinics that need to be uh, obtained and also providing um, guidance about how they can be assessed if uh, trainees are undertaking virtual consultations. So clearly outpatients has utterly transformed in the past couple of months. Um, but I think there, there, was a, there was always a feeling, I could, cause so I was involved in the RCP report about transforming outpatients from the point of view of sustainability as much as anything else a couple of years ago and we and we made the the, the bold statement of perhaps we can get 30 percent of outpatient appointments being virtual and you know a program was heaped down on us so you can't don't be so ridiculous <laughs> we could never do that and yet here we are uh in many places where 70 percent of outpatient appointments are virtual and some are even higher and in general practice even higher still so I think that the way that um, sort of the rapid progression of stuff is happening in the NHS at the moment is through something called the Adopt and Adapt program. So, for example, endoscopy, London are leading on that and they're coming up with ways how can we get through the endoscopy backload. But when it comes to outpatients, the Northwest are leading on that. So they've come up with a careful plan and their vision is to move towards a 30 percent virtual outpatient model running through. So I think that's what we should sort of expect. So I think we do have to train, and that's going to be long term, so I think we do have to train people in how to do virtual consultations. But there are some in interesting advantages. So you could quite easily have a trainer in the same room as the trainee doing a virtual consultation, but the patient won't see the trainer. So you won't get that standard thing of the person always looking at the trainer rather than looking at the trainee. And it will be a much more useful educational experience. Um, and, and I think, you know, it, it works so and also it allows us you know when we talked about shielding and I'm, I'm quite worried about the shielded population um you i think the, the the patients who are shielded really don't want to come into hospital and they're really frightened um so we're going to have to find ways of communicating with them effectively and we're going to have to train people in those ways so i you know to be optimistic i think this is quite a good 
change forward and I think it will allow us to revolutionise outpatients in a way that we've perhaps been a bit tardy about in the past. That's a, that's a really good point. I, I have this, this image of a two-way mirror in the old days of keeping a trainer out of this. Uh, I, I think I might come, come across and I get everyone's opinion on, on, the, on the future now then, because that, that's, we touched on it. The future doctor and the future way of training. I mean, we've, we've been given an opportunity now to transform how, what we do, to work very differently. Um, I might come to Bob first. I mean, the, the future doctor and the future trainee, how, how, how's that going to look? I don't think it's going to look too different from how we how we would all like to to, to have a visit. Um, you know, I think everybody's realised that we have to be uh, much more in partnership with our patients, uh, and education and medicine has been moving along those lines very slowly. We have to embrace technology. We have to allow trainees to become more leaders, give them the ability also to, to understand fellowship as well as leadership, uh, give them the chance to innovate, get stuck into research. So all of those things that we've been thinking about and sort of slowly moving towards, I think will continue to be. The, the, what happened with COVID is everybody's realised that generalism is more important uh, than people perhaps gave it credit to and that has advantages having a generalist workforce, that multidisciplinary team working is really important and you can get, if, if we can, as doctors, we can learn to be better parts of the multidisciplinary team, that's a way forward. But the skills, the USP of a doctor, that diagnostician, that expert, that ability to make decisions and uh, in benefit risk balancing, uh, those are the things that we have to have always been part of the doctor's armory and we need to continue to develop those. Thank you. And I get to, to, to Mike, I mean, what one of two things would you take forward? What are the things that you, you think have really benefited tra either training or, or medicine? <laughs> well, um, big, actually, big question, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think we do need to make sure that every trainee has an equal opportunity when they're going into training. I, I think Andrew's already alluded to the fact that that may not be the existing case. Be that because of geography, be, be that because of allocation to a position of training, etc. We need to make sure that we are dealing with uh, the differential attainment agenda as much as possible and giving, ensuring that anywhere in the country a trainee is given uh, an equal opportunity uh, to provide care to the patients they're serving of the highest quality. Um, I think the pandemic has undoubtedly shown us that we were on the right track but we also need to make sure that we regain some of the areas that have traditionally been physicianly uh, including critical uh, thinking uh, the clinical analysis that bod's just al uh, uh, alluded to i think is one area that we are needing to emphasize even more fair to say wearing my birth tat significant uh, differentials in the use of radiological investigations sometimes inappropriately and we need to make sure that trainees are properly trained to make a clinical assessment and use the most appropriate investigations for that individual patient. So there are some very big things that we need to be majoring on as we're moving forward. And Nancy, what, what would you like to see for, for your future training? You're, you're going to be our, you are our future. What would you like to see? Gosh, and um, well, in addition to what everyone has mentioned so far, I think something that uh, trainees and what we, what we mentioned earlier is looking after trainee well-being and communication between training bodies and trainees. Um, I think that's certainly something that um, has been, you know, something that we've learned and something that some people have benefited from when it's been done well. And I think they're two things that are often ignored. So certainly uh, improving and continuing good communication and then also providing support and services to trainees and no matter what program they think they are on is, is the most important thing for us at the moment. I'd like to pick that point with Andrew, actually. I mean, how, how, how are we going to keep and uh, sustain the, the well-being that's, that's being put forward for, for trainees at the moment? How, how are we going to keep that going in the future? Have you got any plans? I think the most important part of that is making sure that we have adequately staffed roads and hospitals. So our hospitals have enough doctors um, to run the service um, appropriately that we don't need a crisis like this to realize you need to have the right number of registrars on at night and right number of trainees um, and the right supervision from consultants who are available 24 hours a day and people don't think twice about giving them a call in the middle of the night and they don't think twice about coming in and seeing sick patients that's really had a, a huge uh, positive impact 
on the well-being of our trainees. Um, the other thing I think that we've gained a lot from is the technology that uh, Bod's already alluded to. Um, having MDTs, joint uh, cardiac, cardiothoracic meetings that uh, you can join online without having to travel somewhere it just makes everyone's lives more more livable and it means that our trainees can dial in and uh, gain educationally um, when previously they wouldn't have been able to. So the, the technology side of it has been a really big plus. That's good. And I guess one of the other questions just come through right? around, and probably pertinent to you as well, Andrew, around the craft specialties. What, uh, how do you think the uh, angioplasty is and the endoscopists are going to cope in the, in the future, given that they've missed out on so much of their training? We're going to have to look, um, as, as I think uh, Mike mentioned earlier, need to do a gap analysis of where people have missed out um, and do our very best to provide them uh, with adequate experience. We may not be able to provide the numbers that we have done in the, in the past because getting the numbers through the system at the moment is difficult because you, you've got issues about making sure labs are clean in between uh, cases. Um, you've got COVID clear, clean areas, COVID uh, uncertain areas and COVID positive areas. Um, and in the, some of those you need to spend time putting on PPE and so forth. So it, it's not going to be the same, but I still think that we can make sure we have really well-trained uh, new consultants in the future, but we're going to have to do it a, a rather differently. So um, I think i would just come to some final thoughts then. Uh, Mike, have you any final thoughts around the, your experience or anything you've heard today? I think whilst it's been an horrendous experience for many, this is providing us an opportunity to change a great deal of things that need to be changed um, and reinforce some of the things that have been brought in during the pandemic that are really positive. Um, the team structure, the support for trainees, making sure that people do have opportunities, um, really promoting good training, but recognizing where capabilities are rapidly acquired, we don't need to have the same numbers game. We just need to make sure people are truly capable of doing what they're being assessed to be doing. And that should allow us to promote uh, swift training, properly supported training, but we need to make sure that those that are training individuals are also equipped to do that. We're in a time of very significant and very quick change we should take advantage of that and use the opportunities that are presented to us on the back of something as i say that was fairly horrendous thank you um bod yeah i would, I would echo all of that so I, you know clearly we've learned a lot about well-being that needs to stay with us uh, we've learned a lot as andrew's pointed out about you know having an adequate workforce uh, is really good for training both from the point of view of having the trainers on the wall, but also from the point of view of having the workload that is, that is doable. Um, and as Mike said, you know, this is a, a unique moment of transformation in the whole of the NHS. Uh, and if we can't change training now for the better, I think we will struggle at other times because uh, yeah, everybody knows that, that we need to and there is a will to do it. So let's get it right now while we can. The barriers are certainly down at the moment. Andrew? My final thought is that I, I know you started off by thanking trainees um, for what they've done. Um, what we haven't really talked about academic and research uh, at all, but there were a, a huge number of people who came back from academia and from their research to work on the, the front line um, and have had their research uh, impacted on to a great extent. And I think we should really thank them and all the others, the, the, the retirees who came back um, people who came back from community work to work on the front line, they, they've been real heroes and people put their necks on the line. Je you know, we were putting our lives, some of us were putting our lives at risk and uh, some of the juniors did stuff that went well beyond what would, they would have ever expected to have to do. So thank you all um, for, for the things that you've done. That's an extremely good point. Thank you, Andrew. And we, we started, Nancy, and I might finish with Nancy. I mean, I, you know, I, I echo Andrew's thoughts that we really owe a debt of gratitude to our trainees um, for their tremendous support, but the, the, the spirit, you know, and, and how everyone came together and collaborated, it's remained compassionate, it's fantastic. Any final thoughts from yourself and on your experience or from today? I mean, certainly, like everyone is saying, there were, you know, things that 
were learned and, and amazing, you know, amazing things that did happen during such a terrible time. Certainly teamwork, teamwork amongst my colleagues and then amongst different levels within kind of the medical hierarchy was really, really uplifting. Um, and I hope that can go forward. And I hope that um, I suppose trainees will continue to be listened to um, and that uh, our feedback will be taken into account when we move forward with everything to do with trainees. Thank you very much, Nancy. Well, can I, can I end by thanking my panellists, Mike, Bod, Andrew, and, and particularly you, Nancy, for your contribution today uh, and discussing and exploring such a wide range of topics uh, and, and giving us added hope for the future. Um, I thank you again, the audience, for joining our webinar. There's over 500 people I've seen on the webinar today. Uh, can I invite you to our next COVID-19 webinar next Tuesday, 28th, which is on behavioral insights. And our exciting webinar on Monday, the 27th of July, our international conference with a multitude of speakers um, presenting uh, on Monday evening. So thank you very much and thank you for your kind attention and wish you a safe afternoon. Thank you.